Um, good morning, everyone. We're about to commence our, our third um, hearing this morning. Um, Sister um, uh, Esmeralda is having difficulty. This may be English. This may be, uh, yes, they're different. <laughs> Mine is English. <laughs> See, it's okay now? Yes. Changing channel. Oh, he, he, he needs one. Okay. I, yes, I can start. Oh dear, now I've got them all entangled. Okay. Yes, as I was saying, um, we're about to start our third hearing this morning. And this he um, hearing is also an ex officio hearing of the Commission. Um, it's the on the subject of human rights situation of persons affected by the cancellation of TPS, temporary protection status, in the United States, and DACA, deferred action for childhood arrivals in the United States. Um, we have here present um, the uh, representatives of the United States, um, uh, now, um, Andrew Stevenson and James Beehoff. Bishop, <laughs> I, can't, I never get it right. <laughs> Pe people we know of for a long time. <laughs> and um, representatives of civil society who will identify yourself as you speak. Um, you each have 15 minutes, each side has 15 minutes, um, civil society and the, the United States, um, to present your positions. Then the um, committee will have 15 minutes in which to comment or question or make questions. And um, we shall have closing statements, if we have time for seven minutes each, if not for a lesser time, and then one minute for closing of the session. Um, with that, um, I will assist you with these flags. And with that, I call on civil society to make their presentation. Thank you, Madam President. Distinguished Commissioners, on behalf of the organizations participating in this hearing, thank you for the opportunity to present information be before this Honorable Commission about the serious human rights consequences generated by the United States' decision to end the temporary protected status known as TPS and the Deferred Action for Children Arrivals known as DACA. We will divide our presentation in four parts. First, I, Francisco Quintana, representing Sehil, and on behalf of Alianza Americas and Latin America Working Group, we'll be speaking about TPS. Second, we will hear testimony from Janira Arias, a TPS beneficiary on the campaigns manager, and the campaigns manager at CAS Alianza America, one of the organizations participating in this hearing, in which she will explain in her own words the impact that TPS termination will have on her. Unfortunately, because of her status, she will give this as a video conference, and she is accompanied also by Elena Olea from Alianza Americas. And then Lorela Praeli from ACLU will present information regarding DACA recipients. Finally, we will present our request for the commission. Also with us is Sara Mena from ACLU. The United States first established TPS in 1990 to allow for individuals to remain in the United States when they are unable to safely return to their countries or origin of origin due to armed conflicts such as civil war, environmental disasters such as earthquakes, floods or hurricanes, epidemics or any other extraordinary and temporary conditions. In this sense, TPS is a mechanism by which the United States can further compliance with non reformon standards, as well as the balancing test for removal established by this commission in the Wayne Smith case in the year 2010. Since 1991, over 400,000 individuals have received TPS, 
with the majority from Central America and the Caribbean. According to official information, 195,000 Salvadorians, 57,000 Hondurans, and 50,000 Haitians have been allowed to stay in the United States after conflicts and disasters in their countries. TPS was renewed repeatedly over time, and beneficiaries developed family ties in the U.S., worked and studied in the U.S., and had children who are U.S. citizens, of which there are an estimated 275,000. But even if these individuals are treated as permanent residents, their legal status in the U.S. has always been temporary. Until 2016, the renewal of their status was not under threat. But after September 2016, and spe spe specifically under the current administration, TPS holders are battling against time. These decisions have been made after considering that this was a temporary measure that has come, become permanent. There is very little public information available in terms of the assessment made of the improvement of the conditions in these countries. The decision has been made ignoring the causal relationship between some of the factors that, that originally led to the decision to grant TPS and the current situation in those countries. Natural disaster, fragile economies, political instability, severe limitations in the administration of justice, and the rule of law have resulted in conditions of insecurity in which it is now more dangerous to return to those countries than it was when the TPS beneficiaries originally left. There is very little public information available about the reasoning of the United States government to terminate TPS for each country. La lastly, we are deeply concerned about the lack of information regarding analysis by the government of the situation of TPS holders, U.S. citizen children who will be forced to return to countries they do not know or grow without a parent. In light of this lack of transparency, we highlight that it is, a, it is common for states to consider decisions on immigration issues as discretionary, but so, such decisions cannot be arbitrary, create possible grounds of discrimination, or violate fundamental rights. To date, note of the existing legislative proposals, proposals that would address the situation of TPS beneficiaries, neither DACA recipients following the closing of the programs have advanced into law. Currently, there are four draft proposals that offer possibilities of adjustment of a status for TPS beneficiaries after meeting a series of varying requirements. Three of them would offer a path to citizenship following adjustment to legal permanent resident status and one of them offers a continuation of the current temporary renewable protected status. The situations in countries such as in El Salvador are uh, marked by corruption, impunity, and government abuses, also unlawful killings by security forces and delay of lack of compliance with court rulings, violence against women, gender discrimination, and commercial sexual exploitation of women and children. These are only examples of how the conditions in these countries to which TPS holders may be forced to return will affect their human rights. Nevertheless, the decision of the U.S. government has already produced human rights violations to TPS holders currently living in the U.S., as we will now hear from Janira's Arias' testimony. Janira? 17 years ago, I fled gender-based violence in El Salvador. Then I was unable to return after an earthquake leveled my home. Temporary protected status allowed me to put down roots, build a career, contribute to the United States, to support my family and to my community. Now, after, after 17 years, I, as a fully vetted work authorized resident, my life and thousands of other TPS holders' lives have changed seemingly overnight. The cancellation of TPS will soon affect my right to work, right to health, access to justice, and the right to social security and freedom of movement. Because the identification I was granted thanks to TPS will soon be revoked. Due to my work, I am, um, I had to travel across the country, across the United States very frequently. Just not having the ability to work for my employer will soon change my life. TPS for El Salvador is ending, and in less than a year, I'm faced with the prospect of returning to a country that is even more violent when I left. In less than a year, I am forced to become a stranger in my own country, facing a life without, 
without opportunities, with a lot of uncertainty and feeling unsafe. Thank you for hearing my testimony. Thank you, Yanira. So now, as our third part of the presentation, I will give the floor to the representatives of ACLU. Distinguished commissioners, thank you for the opportunity to speak today on the situation of human rights of persons affected by President Trump's decision to rescind the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program and the government's failure to provide a meaningful permanent solution. My name is Lorela Praeli. I am the daughter of Rosa Graciela Angulo Ormeño and Carlos Manuel Praeli Rojas. When I was 10 years old, my parents made the courageous decision to move our family from Lima, Peru, to New Milford, Connecticut. They were committed to raising their daughter in a place where she could reach her full potential and not be limited by her disability. They made the United States of America our home. The issue in discussion today is of personal interest to me. Up until the fall of 2012, I was undocumented. I found my voice and lucha and came out as undocumented and unafraid because of and as part of the immigrant youth movement. Today, I recognize the privileges this life has afforded me, the ability to live without fear of deportation, the fight for my community without fear of retribution, to work without fear of being discovered, and the freedom of movement. My dream, my fight day in and day out, is to extend these rights and protections to dreamers and our families. Today, undocumented immigrant youth face a future of uncertainty. The lives of more than 800,000 Dreamers, longtime U.S. residents, are hanging in the balance due to President Trump's cruel decision to take away their ability to work and expose them to the threat of deep detention and deportation. In 2012, President Obama announced DACA, which allows some individuals who came to the U.S. as children to receive a renewable two-year period of deferred action from deportation and to be eligible for a work permit. My sister, Maria Praeli, is a beneficiary of this program. She was able to graduate from Quinnipiac University in May 2016, and on any given day today, you can find her roaming the halls of the US Congress, fighting for herself and her community. DACA changed Maria's life. On September 5th, 2017, President Trump announced that he was rescinding the DACA program without, with protections expiring on March 5th, 2018, and called on Congress to find a legislative solution. Since then, Congress has considered but failed to pass any legislative solution that would address the precarious situation of DACA recipients. Most of these efforts have sought to include a path to citizenship for immigrant youth only in exchange for a more robust deportation force and the militarization of our border. The current situation is cruel, unacceptable, and has implications for the United States' human rights obligations. First, by denying longtime residents an opportunity to regularize their status, and second, in exposing these individuals to arrest, detention, and deportation through a system with significant human rights violations. Yesterday, the Supreme Court of the United States declined an unusual request from the White House and decided not to hear the administration's appeal on a lower court ruling temporarily blocking it from winding down the DACA program. Under the injunction, beneficiaries who were covered by DACA are allowed to renew their protection and work permit. This is good news for now, but we must not accept this as the norm. Young undocumented immigrants cannot continue to live their lives injunction by injunction, continuing resolution by continuing resolution or tweet by tweet. They deserve the permanent certainty to live their lives not on a couple of months, months notice. My sister said, I've grown up in this country, pledged allegiance to our flag since kindergarten, gone to school and built a life full of memories. I don't picture my life in any other country. This is my home and all I'm asking for is the chance to be able to stay and build my life without the fear of being deported. We appreciate this commission and other international human rights bodies' attention to the termination of DACA. This decision to strip longtime residents of legal protection is devastating to those individuals losing protection and to their families. And is sadly 
only one of the many actions the Trump administration has taken to create insecurity in immigrant communities and to expand the immigration detention and deportation infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. And finally, we will make our request for the Commission. And of course, in the, in the session of questions and answers, as you have heard, we have two powerful testimonies that are willing also to expand on the human rights violations that they, their families, or the people that we represent uh, are suffering. First, for the TACA program, we urge the Commission to call on the United States to reconsider its decision and renew the temporary protection status for the countries for which it was canceled and the DACA, and the DACA program as well until Congress approves legislation that enables them to request a visa or resident permit in light of their long-term residence in the United States. Also, we call on the, uh, as a commission to call on the United States to immediately undertake administrative reforms affirming the obligation of all decision makers to apply legislation and conduct enforcement in a manner that ensures family life, due process, and in which the best interests of the children are protected. The U.S. government has the prerogative to designate immigration enforcement priorities. It could determine that deportation of TPS and DACA beneficiaries should not be enforced. We also request the Commission to call on the U.S. to undertake all legislative, administrative, judicial, and other measures necessary to ensure that civil, social, economic, and cultural rights are guaranteed without discrimination or that they are applied in an arbitrary manner. And finally, to continue to be informed and updated on the development of the legislative debate in the U.S. Congress and make a report on this issue. Specifically on the issue of DACA, we also urge the Commission to request the U.S. government to reinstate the program, to resign the Executive Order 1376-8, en enhancing public safety in the interior of the United States, issued on January 25, 2017. And finally, to urge the United States Congress to pass the DREAM Act and pass legislation providing permanent protection for those uh, beneficiaries of, those, of the programs that we have referred. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I now invite the representatives of the United States to uh, make their submissions. Thank you. Thank you again very much, uh, Madam President. Distinguished commissioners and others, uh, just to underscore, again, I'm Andrew Stevenson from the U.S. Mission to the OAS, and I'm here with James Bischoff from the State Department's Office of the Legal Advisor, and we're here representing the U.S. delegation today. We'd like to begin by thanking the government of Colombia, again, for hosting us here in Bogota, and to commend it also for its ongoing, unflagging commitment to human rights. I will turn the floor over to Mr. Bischoff to give some remarks specific to the subject of this hearing in a few moments. First, however, I would like to simply reiterate the remarks that I gave at the beginning of the first hearing this morning on regulation of gun sales and social violence. In short, the United States has become increasingly concerned about the Commission's tendency to convene thematic hearings on domestic political and legal matters that are complex fast-changing, and the subject of open and robust debate, rather than focusing on the bulk of its energy on addressing the severe backlog of individual petitions. Furthermore, we would urge the Commission to understand that encroachment on issues reserved by international law to the sovereign prerogative of states, such as a nation's sovereign management of its domestic immigration policies, is inconsistent with the Commission's mandate and undermines its credibility. This hearing squarely implicates these concerns. For example, the future immigration status of those persons who have benefited from the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Program, or DACA, is the subject of active consideration in the United States Congress and between Congress and the executive branch, and it is also the subject of pending litigation. As such, the ability of the present delegation to contribute meaningfully to this hearing is very limited. We cannot make any predictions about the future of DACA or its beneficiaries, nor would it be appropriate to discuss in this forum the administration's views on the appropriate course of action or hypothetical outcomes that could emerge from those negotiations. I would refer you, commissioners, and others who are interested to go back to our remarks from this morning for a further elaboration of our serious concerns about the Commission's decision to convene these hearings. 
With that, I will turn the floor over to Jay to give some remarks specific to this topic. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, distinguished commissioners, uh, Executive Secretary Brown and others, uh, good morning to you again. My name is James Bischoff, and today I will discuss the sovereign right of states to regulate the entry and presence of foreign nationals in their territory in accordance with applicable international treaty obligations. I will then give some points explaining temporary protected status, or TPS, deferred action for childhood arrivals, or DACA, and the administration's recent decisions with respect to those programs. The right to admit exclude, expel, and regulate the presence of non-citizens within a state's borders is an inherent and inalienable right of every state, essential to its safety, independence, and welfare. As the Commission itself has acknowledged, international law has long recognized this sovereign right, subject to states' respective international treaty obligations. This principle is also set forth in the Havana Convention of 1928, which provides that, quote, states have the right to establish by means of laws the conditions under which foreigners may enter and reside in their territory, unquote. Our domestic courts, including the U.S. Supreme Court, likewise have recognized this maxim of international law for more than a century. Under our constitutional system, the U.S. Congress passes laws on the admission and exclusion of non-citizens. It also passes laws to prescribe the terms and conditions on which they be permitted to enter or on which they remain after having been admitted, and to establish rules for removing non-citizens who entered or who have remained in violation of the law. In enforcing the immigration laws, Executive branch agencies, such as the Department of Homeland Security, and its components, such as U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, act in accordance with the U.S. Constitution, federal statutes and regulations, and the President's enforcement priorities. The President also has inherent executive authority to control the entry of non-citizens. I'll now say some words about TPS. Congress established the statutory framework for TPS in 1990 by amending the Immigration and Nationality Act, or INA, I apologize for all the acronyms. <clears throat> Congress designed TPS as a discretionary humanitarian measure to provide temporary safe haven to foreign nationals already present in the United States who meet certain requirements and are temporarily unable to return to their home country due to an ongoing armed conflict environmental disaster resulting in a substantial but temporary disruption of living conditions in the area affected or extraordinary and temporary conditions. The foreign national must request TPS. Congress, through the INA, has given the Secretary of Homeland Security the authority to designate a country for TPS and to extend or terminate a country's existing designation. TPS designations and any extensions are limited to periods of up to 18 months before they must be reviewed and assessed to determine whether they should continue. Prior to the expiration of a country's uh, existing TPS designation, DHS reviews conditions in the country and after consultation with appropriate federal agencies, determines whether the statutory conditions for TPS continue to be met. If DHS determines that the conditions upon which the country's designation is based continue to be met, it will extend the designation, which prolongs TPS for existing beneficiaries who timely re-register. DHS has the discretion to make a new designation for TPS on the same or on an alternative basis, which could allow for new beneficiaries. If, on the other hand, DHS determines that the statutory conditions for existing TPS designation are no longer met, it must terminate the designation. Termination ends a country's TPS designation and establishes a date by which beneficiaries who do not hold another lawful immigration status must depart the United States. DPS, DHS generally allows for a period of between six and 18 months for such individuals to retain TPS and TPS-based employment authorization 
while they prepare for their orderly departure. TPS is only available to individuals who were physically present in the United States prior to the date of their country's designation for TPS, as well as meeting other criteria. Throughout the period of designation, DHS cannot detain TPS beneficiaries because of their immigration status, and it cannot remove them from the United States, although TPS may be withdrawn from certain individuals who are no longer eligible to receive it. Beneficiaries are authorized for employment, and they may obtain authorization to travel outside the United States in return. It is important to emphasize that TPS is at its heart designated to be a temporary benefit. DHS may only designate TPS for a given country for a maximum of 18 months and must then, as I said before, re-examine the conditions in the country in order to determine whether to extend or terminate the TPS designation. DHS makes this temporary nature clear to applicants informing them through various channels of the expiration date associated with a designation that TPS does not lead to lawful permanent resident status or give any other immigration status on its own, and that upon termination, TPS beneficiaries continue in any other immigration status they maintained or obtained while holding TPS unless that other immigration status has expired. Individuals granted TPS must re-register each time their country's TPS designation is extended. They do so by submitting an application to DHS, and they must also apply to extend their employment authorization documentation. Beneficiaries of TPS and other stakeholders are provided notice of all TPS decisions. In addition to a notice in the Federal Register, which is the public official journal of the U.S. government, TPS decisions are announced on the DHS website and the website of U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, which is the DHS component that administers TPS programs. TPS does not preclude an individual from seeking a different immigration status. For example, a TPS beneficiary could petition for a change to non-immigrant status, file for adjustment of status to permanent resident-based uh, status so on an immigration uh, petition, for example, uh, one based on marriage to a U.S. citizen, or uh, a TPS beneficiary could seek asylum or withholding of removal, which is essentially withholding of deportation, if he or she fears persecution or torture in his or her home country. In 2017, DHS announced decisions on TPS designations for seven countries that were set to expire. Haiti, Honduras, Nicaragua, Somalia, South Sudan, Sudan, and Yemen. Following careful consideration of available information, including recommendations from other executive branch agencies, DHS determined that the conditions supporting the designation for TPS continued to exist in Somalia, South Sudan, and Yemen. Thus far in 2018, DHS has announced decisions on TPS designations for two countries that were set to expire, El Salvador and Syria. Following careful consideration of available information, including recommendations from other executive branch agencies, DHS deter determined that the conditions supporting the designation for TPS continued to exist in Syria. For El Salvador, Haiti, Nicaragua, and Sudan, DHS determined that the conditions supporting the designations for the country, for, of these countries for TPS no longer existed, and therefore the designations could not legally be extended. In sum, Congress designated TPS to be a temporary humanitarian measure that does not lead to permanent residence or a path to citizenship. The law requires the executive branch to terminate a country's TPS designation when the conditions that led to that designation no longer exist. The United States has provided significant resources and support to the governments of Haiti and Central America to help them recover from the events that prompted their TPS designations and to promote a safe and prosperous region. Thankfully, conditions in these countries are now better, and as a result, those individuals who benefited from TPS may now return home or seek another lawful immigration status, allowing them to remain in the United States. I'll now say a few words about DACA. DACA was established by a memorandum from the Secretary of Homeland Security on June 15, 2012. 
The stated purpose of the policy at the time was to protect from deportation those brought illegally to the United States as children. Under DACA, individuals who meet several key guidelines may request consideration of deferred action for a period of two years subject to renewal. They may also apply for work authorization. DACA determinations are made on a case-by-case -case basis. Deferred action is a discretionary determination to defer removal of an individual as an act of prosecutorial discretion. Deferred action does not confer lawful status upon an individual. In addition, although an individual whose case is deferred will not be considered to be accruing unlawful presence in the United States during the period of deferred in which deferred action is in effect, deferred action does not excuse individuals from any previous or subsequent periods of unlawful presence. Under the June 2012 memorandum, individuals could be considered for DACA as a matter of discretion if they were under the age of 31 as of June 15, 2012, came to the United States before reaching their 16th birthday, have continuously resided in the United States since June 15, 2007 up to the present time, were physically present in the United States on June 15, 2012, and at the time of their request for consideration of deferred action with USCIS, entered without inspection before June 15, 2012, or their lawful immigration expired as of June 15, 2012, are currently in school, have graduated or obtained a certificate of completion from high school, have obtained a general education development certificate, which is basically a high school equivalent, or are an honorably discharged veteran of the Coast Guard or the U.S. Armed Forces, and have not been convicted of a felony, a significant misdemeanor, three or more misdemeanors, and do not otherwise pose a threat to national security or public safety. DACA does not confer lawful permanent resident status or a path to citizenship, a fact that the U.S. administration made clear to the public and to individual requesters uh, on numerous occasions. Only the Congress, acting through its legislative authority, can confer these rights. On September 5th, 2017, in light of pending litigation, DHS rescinded the original memorandum from 2012 that had put DACA in place and announced that it would take all appropriate actions to execute a wind down of the program. As part of this winding down process, DHS stated that it would continue to adjudicate pending DACA initial and renewal requests and associated applications for employment authorization. More recently, in response to federal court orders, DHS has resumed accepting requests to renew a grant of deferred action under DACA on the same terms as were in place before September 5th, 2017, when the memorandum was rescinded. However, DHS is not accepting requests from individuals who have never before been granted deferred action under DACA. DACA recipients may not request permission to travel via an advanced parole. With Congress currently debating legislation to address the status of DACA and others who meet similar criteria, and with several pending lawsuits on the legality of DACA, and as our friends noted, a Supreme Court um, uh, pronouncement on it yesterday, it is clear that this matter is in flux and is working its way through the democratic political process and the judicial system uh, to find a permanent solution. And uh, having said that, we are unable to comment further on DACA given the on ongoing litigation before our federal courts. And so distinguished commissioners, that concludes our presentation today. We look forward to your comments, but we stress again that we may be constrained in answering questions for the reasons we have noted. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I now invite the first vice president to make her representations. Muchas gracias, señora presidenta. Eh, quiero solo eh, reiterar la preocupación que desde la comisión eh, tiene eh, el tema de la protección de los derechos, eh, derecho a la seguridad, derecho a la vida, derecho a la paz, 
eh, derecho al desarrollo eh, y muy particularmente la situación que representa eh, la posición en que se colocan todas las personas que hoy pueden verse afectadas por las respuestas que el sistema legal migratorio eh, de Estados Unidos eh, tiene establecido. Sin embargo, la, la, la realidad, la, la vida diaria, la, el compromiso de la protección de los derechos de, de, los, de las personas en todo el continente eh, nos obligan a expresar nuestra preocupación al gobierno y al Estado de los Estados Unidos eh, en la evaluación que estos programas que están reconocidos en, en las disposiciones legales, que tienen trámites y procedimientos, eh, tengan como, como, como fundamento, como base, eh, el reconocimiento eh, de los derechos de las personas. Y podemos decir, bueno, pero es que estas personas no son ciudadanos de los Estados Unidos y, y la potestad, el poder eh, de soberanía que tienen los estados para determinar eh, sus reglas en materia migratoria, eh, sobre ella, sobre la migración, eh, hoy lo que vivimos en, en el mundo entero es la necesidad de una consideración especial respecto de lo que representa la problemática de vida de estas personas que tienen que salir de sus países, en este caso con lo de DACA, niños que llegaron a, a ese país sin, sin ninguna decisión personal, pero que construyeron su vida en ese país y que se sienten parte de ese país, porque ese país también les ha dado el espacio de su formación, de su educación, y, y, y no es sencillo eh, decir, bueno, nos ten, vamos a aceptar que nos tenemos que ir. La, las historias, el testi, los testimonios que tenemos de, de estas vivencias eh, son expresiones de una necesidad de protección de sus derechos humanos. Gracias. Thank you. And now we invite the second vice president to make his comments. Gracias. Yo soy el relator temático. Eh, todo lo que tenga que ver con migrantes, con migraciones, y pues por supuesto que este es de los problemas más álgidos que estamos afrontando en la actualidad. Eh, de nuevo agradezco que, que el ilustre Estado de los Estados Unidos haya comparecido, que nos traigan posiciones críticas que también hacen falta. Eh, empe empiezo por considerar alguna que dice que eh, en vez de seleccionar audiencias de esta índole o de aquellas que tengan que ver con asuntos internos de los estados, sería preferible eh, prestarle más atención a las peticiones individuales que aparecen estancadas en, en, en un, pro, un problema que pues todos los comisionados normalmente encontramos cuando llegamos. Por supuesto que esto se ha ido acumulando, pero tengan la seguridad que siempre estamos eh, como eh, trabajando en procura de enfrentar esa situación de atraso procesal. Eh, el año pasado, de hecho, creo que podemos reportarlo públicamente, eh, se dieron muchas más admisibilidades que cualquier otro año. Eh, igual las decisiones de fondo superaron las de los años anteriores eh, en, en materia de medidas cautelares también. De manera que el tema de casos de peticiones y de medidas de lo concerniente al reglamento lo hemos procurado atender de, de la, con la mayor diligencia. 
El hecho de que se seleccionen audiencias temáticas que puedan involucrarse en asuntos internos de los estados, pues tienen que ver de todas maneras con derechos humanos. Es decir, cada vez que haya violación de derechos humanos, nosotros tenemos que pronunciarnos, tenemos que eh, fijar posiciones. Y en este sentido, por supuesto, estamos hablando de la afectación de cientos de miles de personas que crecieron en Estados Unidos, que de una u otra manera aportaron también a la riqueza, a la grandeza de los Estados Unidos, que crecieron con sus costumbres, que realmente se ajustaron realmente a los requerimientos eh, legales de los Estados Unidos y que por supuesto en este momento están siendo sorprendidos por eh, decisiones como las que se han tomado en este gobierno con relación a, a esta situación del DACA, del TPS. Eh, y que les, les digo si sí, sí constituyen una preocupación muy grande para la Comisión Interamericana, para los sistemas incluso. Eh, ahora que tenemos pactos eh, este año, estoy seguro que este va a ser un tema que, te, que vamos a tener que abordar a nivel orbital, a, a nivel mundial, porque pues eh, la verdad es que si no fuera por determinadas decisiones judiciales internas, de los propios jueces norteamericanos. Yo no sé dónde hubieran ido a, a, a parar estas situaciones, pero, pero sí, sí notamos nosotros que ha habido un franco retroceso en estas materias por parte de este gobierno. Hemos ya hecho llamados de atención, hemos hecho comunicados, hemos exhortado, porque eh, Francisco Quintana nos estaba haciendo aquí la solicitud de que ojalá y le hiciéramos petición a los Estados Unidos, pero yo creo que ya lo hemos hecho, la verdad, y procuramos hacerlo de la mejor manera posible en el ánimo de que ojalá y se les garantice a estas personas por un determinado eh, espacio de tiempo eh, la regulación o la regularidad de su situación pero sí debe entender el gobierno de los Estados Unidos que los países de los cuales salieron con ocasión de estas emergencias eh, derivadas de cuestiones climáticas o de desastres ambientales, pues son países en los cuales la situación de violencia ha empeorado y no pueden realmente regresar, retornar fácilmente porque van a encontrarse un país que les es extraño, el país que realmente les es de sus afectos es el de los Estados Unidos, no en vano las personas que migran desde, todo, desde todos los espacios eh, tienen en mente el sueño americano y con eso del sueño americano entonces están todo el tiempo es tratando de ingresar justamente a los Estados Unidos. El Triángulo Norte es por supuesto uno de, de los problemas más caracterizados que existen al respecto y por esa circunstancia se, sí sencillamente aprovechar la presencia de los representantes del ilustre Estado americano para decirles que la verdad es que sí estamos muy preocupados por las políticas de securitización de fronteras, del de muro, de que se ha venido hablando desde hace eh, algunos meses, esto que tiene que ver con el TPS, eh, el DACA, eh, y que consecuencialmente nos agradaría muchísimo que se fijaran políticas eh, tendientes a regularizar la situación de personas que, repito, crecieron en Estados Unidos y que le han aportado a su manera eh, hacia la riqueza. Son personas que han trabajado allá y de pronto en oficios que los eh, propios eh, natales norteamericanos no los hubieran realizado. Sí lo han realizado estas personas de origen latinoamericano. Eh, perdónenme la expresión que voy a dar, pero, pero es cierta ha sido mano de obra barata, ya que han encontrado y sin embargo ahora que ya han cumplido todas estas, estas labores, entonces se encuentran de la noche a la mañana con que la política ha cambiado radicalmente y se han tomado decisiones que los van a afectar. Por esa circunstancia, pues yo sigo desde luego preocupado como relator y repito, menos mal que la justicia norteamericana ha tomado decisiones que de una o de otra manera han evitado que la situación se torne mucho más dramática 
casi catastrófica para esta gran cantidad de personas. De manera que eh, simplemente me, me agradaría escuchar propuestas más directas de la eh, sociedad civil, pero les repito, yo creo que los pronunciamientos ya los hemos hecho y hemos hecho exhortaciones muy respetuosas a los Estados Unidos eh, que aspiramos a que los podamos ir nutriendo con el paso del tiempo y con el paso de las estadísticas y escucharlos. Me parece que es muy importante a ustedes para que nos digan realmente las propuestas eh, en qué sentido podrían incrementarse para favorecer los derechos humanos de las personas que han sido afectadas. Um, Thank you, Ms. President. Um, I just like to make two comments, but first I'd like to express the gratitude of this commission, counting on the valuable and so important contribution from the civil society and the state representatives. Uh, my first comment, again, is to emphasize to, and to clarify the mandate of our commission, based on Article 106 of OAS Charter, and as well as the American Declaration. Uh, so our mandate is to strengthen and safeguard inter-American human rights standards. So our mandate, we are exercising our mandate when we protect, promote, and defend human rights provided by the American Declaration, which was signed by um, the US um, so this is the first comment. And the second is the human rights approach towards migration. Because migration per se is a result of human rights violations somewhere. And now we are facing a situation in which the cancel of those programs could bring a very uh, serious and systematic violations of the rights of 800,000 people. So it's really the voice of those people, the suffering of those people that demands our attention. Uh, rights such as equal protection, non-discrimination, right to life, family protection, a number of social economic rights which were raised here. So I just like to highlight the human rights approach to my migration as uh, our dearest colleagues uh, Commissioner Esmeralda and our special rapporteur for migrants, my dearest friend and colleague, uh, Commissioner Vargas, stressed. So that's our mandate. We are exercising because human rights there could be and would be, would be threatened if we would have the cancel of those programs and lives and destinies of those 800,000 people would be into risk. Thank you so much. Thank you. I now invite the Executive Secretary to make some comments, if he so wishes. Muchas gracias, señora Presidenta. Apenas dos comentarios. Una pregunta si, si los representantes estatales o si el Estado considera, a la luz de los comentarios de las organizaciones de la sociedad civil, eh, apreciar propuestas legislativas que eventualmente puedan asegurar la creación de vías regulares, seguras y accesibles para que los beneficiarios de los programas de ACA y TPS puedan adquirir eventualmente una condición migratoria regular permanente. Y si en, esta, en el ejercicio de estas políticas internas se están siendo considerados los riesgos a la vida de las personas beneficiarias de los programas, sea antes o incluso después de una eventual deportación. Muchas gracias. Um, thank you so very much. Um, I, I think I have about six points to make, which I should make extremely quickly. Um, the first point in relation to TPS, I must admit that I am rather confused um, having listened to you because I may have misheard which is quite possible. Um, but um, I understand that you stated um, that um, the, they can, TPS persons can apply to change their status. Then later on, you seem to have said but that the position which is recognized by Congress and so on when they, this um, 
status was put in place is that it is temporary and it cannot lead to permanent residence. So I'm a little bit you know, confused about that. So I hope you can clear my confusion later. Um, next is that one, the pers TPS persons uh, um, and of course uh, DACA dreamers are by and large productive persons. They're productive persons who will not be a drain on, on the resources or endanger the security of the United States. And um, whatever uh, um, their legal status is, and in fact, presently, it is almost non-existent uh, because it is so threatened. Um, one doesn't question the issue of um, the United States having the power to expel those who um, um, breach the laws of the United States who act in a criminal manner and in a dangerous manner against the other citizens of the state. Clearly, one can do so. But these two groups are in a special position. Placed in that position, well, the dreamers, they were brought in ultimately, but the TPS, you permitted, the state permitted them to come in on a temporary basis. But the temporary basis in so many cases has gone on for over 20 years. Now, that being so, surely the principle of estoppel would apply, uh, I think, that in fact the conduct of the United States by permitting persons to stay on a temporary uh, um, permit, which kept on being extended for 20 years, the understanding of that person would be that yes, this will go on being extended. And then all of a sudden you say no, this was only temporary and you can go. That um, is, is, is a little bit, I must, I, I do apologize for using the word inhuman because even on humanitarian grounds in relation to the two groups, one would, have, would hope that the Congress members of the United States would recognize the fact that these people have been there and those, as I say, who have acted legally have not um, breached the laws of the country and are productive and are showing that they're going to be productive members of the country would enhance the development of the United States and that they themselves and, and created a position of permanence, a permanence in their residence. And in relation to the dreamers, the, your courts apply the principles of the best interest of the child. And there's the principle of when the child is in a settled home without abuse and so on, you do not remove the child from that residence, which is in really what those who are seeking to terminate uh, the dreamers and send them to their countries of birth is seeking to do. And that will be contrary to your laws, which, which you uphold. And it's Congress that makes the laws. Uh, um, so I, the whole issue is confusing to me, especially on those two points, the specific points that I articulated. And I do hope that one would recognize the fact and, and agree that even if you have strict legal positions, it is always open to a country or an, an institution which has the facility and capacity under the law to, on humanitarian grounds, do the complete opposite of what the law says. That also has to be considered. I, op I uh, adopt all the statements made by my learned colleagues on this at the table, and um, I now um, invite you to make your closing address. Um, and unfortunately, you will each have five minutes. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Quiero, eh, quiero responder a una pregunta que se presentó en esta discusión, en este discurso. 
Y bueno, yo creo que con la pregunta de qué puede seguir haciendo la Comisión, eh, siento que tenemos que seguir abogando. Abogando por los derechos de nuestra comunidad inmigrante, abogando por los jóvenes Dreamers y abogando por las personas que tienen esa protección del TPS. Lo digo que el seguir abogando es importante y crucial en este momento porque tenemos que tener una solución permanente. No podemos seguir viviendo en este estado de incertidumbre, del no saber si es que el día de mañana el presidente va a decidir tomar aún acciones o medidas más eh, crueles frente a la comunidad inmigrante indocumentada presente en los Estados Unidos. Yo creo que otro paso importante que le pedimos a ustedes es llevar a cabo, eh, abogar para que el presidente y la administración rescinda la orden 13768. El presidente Trump ha ordenado a su administración que aplique de manera más agresiva las leyes de inmigración, desatando la fuerza del gobierno federal para encontrar, detener y deportar a los que viven en el país de manera ilegal, independientemente de si han cometido crímenes graves o no. Es decir, que no hay una política que prioriza a qué personas se deben de deportar, sino que deportan y identifican a cualquier persona que está presente de manera indocumentada. La misma administración de Trump, a través, él mismo y a través de sus representantes, han hecho muy claro que no hay excepciones en este momento bajo este gobierno. Entonces, estos jóvenes Dreamers, así tengan esta protección temporal del DACA por el día de hoy, no es algo permanente y es algo que ellos están abusando. Hemos visto muchos casos en los cuales los jóvenes Dreamers se encuentran que el día de hoy tienen DACA y el día de mañana la administración intenta retirárselo de manera individual, a pesar de que lo han tenido en las últimas, los últimos seis años. Entonces, vemos el día de hoy que en los Estados Unidos el gobierno de Trump ha creado una cultura de miedo y están implementando eh, políticas no solo para identificar, detener y remover a las personas en los Estados Unidos, sino también de crear una cultura donde el miedo es tan fuerte y tan inaceptable que estos mismos migrantes, estos mismos inmigrantes indocumentados deciden retirarse de los Estados Unidos. Sí, muchísimas gracias. En relación con, con lo que señaló el Estado, creo que es importante que la Comisión siga reiterando que es responsabilidad del Estado como un todo, no es solo el Ejecutivo, es el Legislativo y el Judicial, y en conjunto la Comisión Interamericana podría revisar sus actuaciones y en ese sentido un informe sobre buenas prácticas tendientes a la regulación migratoria creo que podría aportar no solo para Estados Unidos, sino para la región y como mencionó el relator Vargas, eh, en este momento de la negociación de los pactos globales sobre migración, creo que esto sería súper importante. El párrafo 54 del informe de fondo del caso Wayne Smith contra Estados Unidos, el párrafo 54 establece al menos 10 elementos que deben de ser considerados, por ejemplo, si la persona habla el idioma, si la persona tiene vínculos con la familia, si la persona tiene vínculos con, con la sociedad. Y en ese sentido, la comisión debería documentar las violaciones que se originan. Por ejemplo, si una persona es deportada y muere, como ya ha sucedido, creo que la comisión tiene ese rol fundamental de señalar, identificar cómo el principio de non-refoulement se, se violenta. Y en el último minuto, no sé si Yanira tendría alguna propuesta, algún pedido específico a la comisión, una acción. Si le activan el micrófono, perdón, ¿quién está…? En? Listo. Sí. Eh, Un minuto, yes, gracias. Good afternoon. Uh, what we are asking here is to find a solution with the administration and Congress, and importantly, there hasn't been any uh, successful conversations inside Congress, and that is a red flag, and it's raising more uncertainties, not just for myself, but for the uh, thousands of people protected under TPS and uh, DACA. We ask more collaboration from the administration and Congress to find a solution as soon as possible. As we stated in, in our testimonies, time is running, every day counts, every day a, a family is impacted by the cancellation of TPS and by the cancellation of protections for DACA recipients and TPS holders. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we invite the United States to make their final comments. 
Thank you very much, Madam President. Just on, on two points, and I'll pass the, the microphone then to Jay. First, with respect to Central America, I can say that uh, under the current administration, we remain committed to working collaboratively uh, through the OAS, but also with our partners in Central America. And the U.S. strategy for engagement and cooperation in Central America reflects the ongoing commitment of the administration um, to work in partnership with Central America. Uh, we hosted a high-level conference on security and stability in Central America in June 2017, attended by Vice President uh, Pence. Um, and we would also note that uh, compared to the 1980s, um, the region is relatively free from armed conflict, politically stable, and a strong economic partner of the United States. We continue our engagement in the region focused on promoting prosperity, um, enhancing security efforts in partnership with governments in Central America, and also improving in gover governance issues. So it reflects we continue to be engaged, there's progress, we see a positive movement forward. With respect to the Global Compact on Migration, which Commissioner uh, Vargas Silva uh, had been mentioned, I can confirm that we continue to be engaged on discussions regarding the Global Compact, although we are not participating in that process, through the OAS's Committee on Migration, the CAM process. We've made statements regarding our engagement generally on inter-American uh, matters with respect to migration in the CAM, and we also underscored the position of Ambassador Nikki Haley, our Ambassador to the United Nations, um, in saying that although uh, uh, we are not participating um, in the, uh, the Global Compact process, America is proud of our immigrant heritage, our long-standing moral leadership in providing support to migrant and refugee populations around the globe. No country has done more than the United States, and our generosity will continue. But our decisions on immigration policies will always be made by Americans and by Americans alone. We will decide how best to control our borders and who will be allowed to enter our country. And that will govern how we also engage in multilateral fora. We welcome the opportunity to discuss how this uh, works in synergy with the CAM, with the OAS, and with the Commission. Jay? Thanks. Just very briefly, um, I wanted to respond to a couple of things. Uh, Commissioner McCauley, you asked for clarification about um, the ability of TV TPS uh, beneficiaries to change their status. So the point I was making was it's not an extension of TPS benefits. It's, it, it's, it's, it would be a, um, a, a transfer to some other kind of status um, uh, that would be available to a TPS beneficiary in the United States. So they could, they could petition to change uh, to some non-immigrant status. There are various complicated procedures that I'm not um, extremely familiar with for doing that. Um, they could file for adjustment of status to permanent residents based on an immigration petition that they would submit to the appropriate um, uh, uh, p p um, part of DHS. Um, for example, if they got married to a US citizen, um, they could, could, could seek to change their status to, to permanent residence um, over time. They could seek asylum. I think we discussed that a little bit. Um, they could seek withholding of removal, um, which is a, a legal mechanism available for those who fear uh, persecution on, uh, on certain protected grounds. Um, and they could also seek protection from removal under the regulations implementing the United States obligations under the Convention Against Torture. Um, and so those are just a few of, of uh, the, the possibilities for beneficiaries to change to a status that would allow them to remain in the United States. And there are, they've all got a number of different requirements, and we don't have time to go into those today. Um, I just want to do two more things. Uh, first, I want to... I want to reiterate, you know, we, we, we maintain our position, as Andrew just said, that, that uh, control of uh, domestic uh, immigration law and policy is the sole authority and jurisdiction of sovereign states. And to that point, I just wanted to, I just wanted to say one more thing about Commissioner Abra or, or Executive Secretary Abrao's point about the, the proposals for legislation. Um, as I noted in, uh, in the main presentation, we're, we're, we're not in a position today to discuss these, these e extremely rapidly changing matters. Um, it, you know, it, 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 the, 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 the ground shifts every day in Congress. It's, a, it's part of a robust 
open, active, democratic debate in our democratic system. And it's, and it's, it's really, you know, a, a model for how a democratic society debates an issue of great importance. And it's something also that has the active involvement of all three branches of our government, as Commissioner Vargas mentioned, the involvement of the judiciary here as well. So, um, it, you know, everyone can sort of, you know, uh, look at publicly informa available information in the coming weeks and see how, how these things play out. But it's all a part of our robust democracy um, in action. Thanks. Um, thank you very much. If I may make some closing remarks um, before I uh, thank you both for being here. Um, I, I'm pleased you mentioned the debates um, going on because um, I was going to ask about the status of the negotiations going, but nobody knows. I didn't think you would have an answer, so I didn't, because the negotiations will go on in Congress until they come to some kind of um, decision. Um, it is just that in, in following our mandate, we have to try to urge um, um, agents of the state um, to perhaps bring certain matters to the attention of your lawmakers and, and members of other branches of your government. Um, because our, our mandate covers the lives and um, rights of all persons in the Americas, um, as we had mentioned in the earlier hearing. And um, I do, we do recognize your right to, to challenge our jurisdiction, which you always do, and with, um, yet um, we're happy that, that you continue to uh, attend and participate in the processes of, of this um, our August body of the Commission of Human Rights um, of the Americas. And um, I, it demonstrates the interest which your state does take in, in, uh, in our survival. And you have been an original member of the whole system of justice uh, in the Americas from the inception. Uh, in fact, I recall that you had a citizen in the Inter-American Court from the first group as indeed was a Jamaican as well. <laughs> and um, and as, as, as we know, um, you will, and, well, let me put it this way. We continue to hope that you will give, continue to give the support that you do to our institutions in order for them to survive, because it is necessary. Our system of justice is necessary in the, the region, and it is necessary for the commission to survive and survive healthily in order to protect the lives and rights of all peoples in, in, in the Americas. I have to mention this. We are aware and we have received testimonies about the appalling conditions of your, um, so many of your immigration centers, um, including one in Washington State. Um, and and there's the mirrored many of them, um, which we will try to follow up on in the course of the year. And um, also, we hope that there will be, if it is necessary to detain persons in centers, that, that some changes will, will occur, especially that the privatization of the running of these places would cease because um, these companies are only interested in making profits and are not interested in the survival or dignity of the peoples in their care. Um, and it is the responsibility of the state to ensure that those who are in custody are sufficiently protected. Um, um, I think that is all I have to say except to thank civil society for participating and giving us information on this thing. And we ask for you 
to continue to give us information and we note your recommendations and I'm sure um, the representatives of the State Department have noted them and we will continue to monitor the situation. We thank you, mem members of the State Department of the United States, for coming here and also participating um, as, as a true member of the American states of this region. And we hope to see you soon in better circumstances. Thank you very much, all of you. This hearing is at an end. Paolo, I want, need to see you, and Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Yeah.